Hey guys, welcome to No Tux Allowed. This is our latest episode. And yes, of course, we have security news in this episode too. So, for the record, the recording date of this podcast is September 30th, 2024. Because that might matter. Because uh, I have this guy with me named Big Pod. He, tip- he typically uh, goes pretty deep on how these things work. But I think I might have him beat this time. We'll find out. We're going to see. Yeah. So, uh, Big Pod. Hi. First of all, I just want to say uh, that I have briefly attempted a Silver Blue only challenge. Wow. And it worked for the most part, except for one fundamental issue. Because I wanted to go as far as I can with pure Silver Blue. As in, we're not enabling the RPM Fusion repositories. We're not dealing with the Ublue project or anything like that. Well, uh, for the production of this podcast, uh, we use a package called V4L2 Loopback. That's a uh, if you've seen like uh, me like flip my camera to to the screen or anything like that in the show. Uh, if you're watching the video version, that's how I'm that's how I'm accomplishing that. Well, it turns out. That Fedora does not ship the V4L2 loopback package in their repositories. That's only found in RPM Fusion. So my challenge failed. Interesting. <laughs> it failed within the first half hour. <laughs> so you're now back on Gen 2, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Gen 2 because it's like, you know what? I am the Gen 2 guy. I'll just install Gen 2. Whatever. When you had the choice of just switching to Ublu. Uh, yeah. And it's being uh, you all know, taken it, care for you. Yeah. Well, it turns out that uh, I still have way too many scripts that call my home directory very manually. And uh, I just didn't want to have to rewrite a bunch of scripts. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want to do that because I know I'm going to be getting off this thing and then go back to a normal distro. Then I have to rewrite these all over again. And I know I could totally do like this git branch thing and have like an immutable distro branch. But or, we're not doing that. Or you would have done it properly the first time. Or that. Yes, or that. But you know, some some distros don't support dollar sign home or tilde. Really? Or... Yeah, it's it's like a pathing thing. Uh, I'd have to like double check it, but I know that uh, it doesn't work too well on how uh, Silver Blue uh, works with with their pathing. Like uh, for some reason, it doesn't respect that. I have to manually call the var mnt home or var var home or whatever it is. I can't remember the exact path off the top. Technically of speaking, I believe. For script var uh, slash home slash should still work. You'd think, but it doesn't. It does, at least in my experience. Um, I might be calling my path wrong then. So, uh, somebody just go to uh, gitlab.com slash tenlyj slash dot files and uh, tell me what I'm doing wrong. But anyways, uh, let's get on to the big topic <laughs> here that the uh, that we talked about, and uh, we decided that I decidedly to name this episode after because I thought it was cool. Cool, uh, recalling old internet memes, but uh, cups, big pod, yeah, once yeah. again has fallen victim to a to the cr- critical vulnerability uh thing. I can't remember what CVE stands for, but it's a it's got a CVE and it's got a score of nine point nine. So that means that it's dangerous. It's dangerous, big pod. <laughs> yeah. But how how bad is it really? First of all, it's not 9.9. It was it was told it's gonna be 9.9 and it's nowhere near there. Yeah, it's still oh. in the 8 point something territory and 9 point, I believe 9.3 is the biggest one out of the four. 9.2, 9.3 I believe, but not 9.9. That's uh, a lot, a lot more severe. And just for information, the CV stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Ex- Exposures. Oh, okay, okay. Either way, it's still pretty bad because, uh, because you know, uh, most of the vulnerabilities that uh, we've discussed up to this point have not actually been scored this high. Yeah. And... So this, this this is pretty bad. But uh, the way 
But uh, I see that this has to deal with a system service called Cups Browse, yeah. or Cups Browse D. And uh, if you don't know what that service is, uh, that's the cup service that automatically discovers your printers for you. Yeah. So, and it does, and it does that through you know everybody's favorite secure cybersecurity topic of multicast DNS as well. So, uh, this is yet another multicast D- DNS uh, vulnerability that maybe, maybe you shouldn't be enabling this out of the box. Arch Linux, <laughs> Debian. But yeah. Uh, so the the recommendation is, is if you're vulnerable, is to disable the Cups Browse uh, D service. And uh, fun fact, on your Fedora family of distros, that's typically disabled out of the box. Yeah, uh, I I can't say for like the downstream forks like uh, Nobara or. Uh, well, I, I would assume that Bazite would probably have it disabled for Bad-hate for logical disabled. reasons. But like uh, Nobara, Ultramarine, and, and those, I can't say for those, but I know on Fedora and Red Hat, they are disabled. And I can and, say uh, at least for Bluefin and Aurora, it is disabled yeah. as well. So that's why you need to manually add your printer in, on uh, the systems. So, But uh, I know for a fact that it is enabled and running on Ubuntu. <coughs> because uh, the very first link in the description comes from evilsocket.net. Or evilsocket.net. And uh, this is the guy that actually reported the vulnerability. And he did this semi-responsibly. We'll get we'll get into a bit more details uh, later. But uh, he went in and uh, d- got looking around at the source code... And found that uh, Cups was listening on port 631 for UDP traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Big Pod, uh, you, you seem like you know you have an understanding about how this uh, vulnerability works out. So I'm going to let you uh, describe it first. And if you say anything wrong, I'll do my best to correct you. So basically, in the nutshell, your... Uh, uh, Cubs Browse D can detect any any nearby nearby in quotations uh, printer so that would normally mean in your local area network and it would add it but because it is listening on any address on port 631 you can using IPP in theory, add any printer that is on any internetly accessible network. Which then means, if you can get that printer on that one specific computer, you can then, because you can give it certain information, make it run on print anything you want. So what you're saying is that if I have a cup server running... That is opened through to the internet, yes. and I happen to have no firewall protection whatsoever. Some random guy on the internet can print to my printer. No, what I'm saying is, if you have your cups on your system, if it doesn't have any kind of firewall, so if the computer is directly connected to the internet, yeah, so if you can hit that specific computer from the internet without any firewall, that means you can access port six thirty one. At which point, uh, a printer somewhere can pre- can tell your cups, I am a printer, add me. At which point, printer will get some inf- uh, your cups will get some information from the printer, and it will add it into your as a, as one of your printers. At which point, when you print, you're owned. And it can execute any command it wants on your system. That is because... With root privileges, because Cups runs yeah. as root. <laughs> yeah. And that is because uh, one of the options for essentially uh, going through what is happening, like uh, changing formats so the printer can print, 
is this thing called Fomatic Rip, which basically has an option for command line, which can then execute any command any command line argument for any command line task you want. So bash scripts, any program, anything whatsoever. And okay, so that's how uh, you get remote code execution. Now, uh, if you're listening to this, first of all, we already mentioned two very critical things that that uh, ma- that uh, makes you kind of doubt that uh, you you're vulnerable to this. First of all, we mentioned we we mentioned that there are some distros that have it disabled. And then the second thing that you might have heard me emphasize was the word firewall. Yes, that's your home internet router. And by default, they're probably not running port 631 as an open port. Also, if you're if you have NAT, you're already secured from this. Because you're by the definition you're behind not a security barrier, but behind some sort of a barrier. It's not a security tool, let's be clear. But it is a barrier that prevents you from just being every computer being exposed on every port to the internet. Yeah. And uh, an- another keynote here, uh, and this is the second link in the description of, of the show. Uh, this has already been fixed. It's been fixed in the upstream cups. It's already been backported as far as Debian stable. Yeah. So uh, just update your systems. You should be fine. Uh, I think I, I think Ubuntu might even have like a patch for this too. Or, you know, like I said, if just run... If you're running a systemd distro, just systemctl status cups dash browse d and just see if it's running. If it's running, just turn it off because heaven forbid <clears> you're probably not actually using it anyway. And better yet, let's have firewalls. Yeah, or you know, like you you install Ubuntu. The first thing, one of the very first commands you probably should responsibly run on an Ubuntu system is sudo ufw enable. Yeah, because it shifts with ufw out of the box. It just doesn't turn it on because Sometimes you want to be insecure by default. Yeah. I Sometimes. probably should enable firewall D on my Linux system. I mean, I, I enable firewall D. I don't. Oh. <laughs> maybe maybe you should turn it on. But anyways, uh let's I want to delve into a little bit about this conversation. For, first of all, Evil Socket has shown up in the in like these these uh, vulnerability disclosures in the past. Uh, in fact, in his blog post, he re- the very uh, he links three different times that he's resp- that he is a uh, reporter vulnerabilities. And uh, I have read some of the vo- the uh, disclosure for uh, the Cups project here, and uh, there are some issues coming from both sides of this conversation. So when he the very first thing that he did when he resp- when he reported. Is the cups team is basically the cups team did it did did the sort of uh, is this even a vulnerability uh, kind of question? Of course. And but because who you wouldn't? because you know, yeah, uh, and uh, you know this guy, I didn't know who he was before this happened. You probably didn't know who who he was before this happened, yeah. Big Pod. I so it's just like, why should we listen to you? Like I, uh, <coughs> when I first heard of this, I was like. Who is this? And saying nine point nine vulnerability and and it's got everything is vulnerable. Like, who is this guy? Well, now we know who is this guy. Yeah, now we know who he is, and uh, he he kind of took offense to this and uh, got talking very angrily with the Cups team for asking these very reasonable questions, and uh. It got to the point of where he took it to Twitter, <laughs> and he and like the Twitter thread. I haven't read the entire thread, mostly because I wasn't logged into Twitter, so I couldn't read the entire thread anyway. <laughs> but uh, it got a little spicy. So, uh, just a recommendation. First of all, uh, Cups team, you if somebody's reporting a vulnerability. Take the time to read what they're saying. And yeah. if it turns out that there's <clears throat> the potential of a vulnerability, 
maybe not sound so off putish when you're telling some when you're asking somebody for like their credibility or you know just don't ask their credibility just ask the question of how bad is this actually can 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 we get like more information or you know put it out towards like a triage team and go like hey triage team can you look into this yeah but at the same time because you time, know that's that's what they're supposed to do <laughs> yes but at the same time we're still talking about an open source project probably gets hundreds of these a month yeah especially possibly. at and this point with the advent of ai and really bad s- reports like look at what a creator of curl is talking about all the time how he what kind of reports he's receiving. I wouldn't be surprised if cops people receive the same kind of reports. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the libcrawl has ma- has very publicly stated his issues with reporting vulnerabilities in the past, too. Yeah. So, so Where, you know, some teams make it way more difficult than it actually has to be. But uh, the, the, big, the big onus here is on this evil socket guy, right? First of all, the cups team was asking you very logical questions. They don't know who you are. You your name has never showed up in this project before. You're not a particularly prominent name. So, I understand that you're reading that, but before you before you send out your angry reply, stop saving it in a text editor somewhere. Go outside for a walk or something. Calm down. If you have grass, go ahead and touch it, I guess. And then come back and go like, do I really want to say that to this team? Because as soon as you start insulting people, uh, your vulnerability that you're attempting to report loses a lot of credibility yeah. right then and there. Yeah. There there was no reason this ever had to go towards like threatening, threatening, you know, disclo- early disclosure on Twitter. That is not the place to do that. Yeah. So, uh, please, uh, take a take a minute and you know, uh, go through this properly. That said, if you're the viewer and uh, you're kind of curious as to how the cup system works or like how printing works in general on Unix systems, he does actually do a pretty good dive on how uh, cups interacts with the printers on your ne- on your uh, just interacts with your printers. So, go ahead and read. Go ahead and read the uh, the uh, report. It's called "Attacking Unix Systems Via Cups Part One." So there's probably a follow up to this, and uh, I look forward to see what that is. Yeah, but there is also a lot of like when they're explaining things, even some data they put in that blog post. I'm like, do I really? Do I really? put that much stock in that number i don't like, yeah that, that said that said uh don't be afraid to take it with a grain of salt but uh if you're the listener uh don't reach out to this guy and like question his credibility yeah. to him because don't. heaven forbid he, he already gaslighted cups so let's not uh, let, let's not start any fights here i don't want to start any fights and besides the point it did it did wind up being an actual problem they it, yeah it they didn't it look. was a real problem yeah he he did he he initially did everything right, <coughs> and that that's great. We need more people to do that. But uh, you know, uh, calm down a little bit. But anyways, Big Pod, uh, let's talk about some good news. Okay, so uh, there has been an announcement by uh, Levante Poyak. Sorry, I think if I said that. That is wrong. Uh, I think he's German. So I hope I got his name yeah. right. Uh, Google Translate was definitely of assistance there. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, he he uh, posted an exciting uh, announcement where Valve, uh, yes, that company, the company behind Steam, which you know, if you play video games on Linux, you probably have their product on your system. Uh, they have uh, Valve has decided to provide two very critical pro services for uh, Arch Linux. And the very first thing that's going to be mentioned there is build service infrastructure. Uh, Big Pod, you might you might be aware of how important or well how special a dedicated build server is for you. 
And uh, I recognize a little bit of that appeal too, even though, you know, yeah. I am the Gen 2 user. I am the build service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, if, you, if you're not a programmer, uh, could you explain that for, for them, what a build service would do for you? It would build on a separate machine the program at whatever time interval you want or whatever schedule, where it be when you create a new commit, whether it be when you are just every so often. And it is very important, especially for organizations that, that uh, release things publicly so that it always is on the same hardware that is trusted. And for something okay, like so... Arch Linux, that should be extremely important. Well, it's extremely important because you got to remember Arch Linux is this uh, distro that's famous for being <clears throat> upstream. They are the yep. latest and greatest. Uh, that, or at least that's their stated goal. Sometimes it takes a couple of days, but you know, uh, th this makes it so that way when you know the package package maintainer says, "Hey, I like this package. Save, commit to the Git rep repository." Uh, what this what this will do then is is that this build service will then pull in that package that package uh, description file yep. and figure out and build the package for the guy. Yeah. And, and it'll either it, it's either going to do this right away or like every six hours or some interval like that. But it's going to do it. That way he can get back to doing what he's doing. And you know, that build service might have a more powerful system than him. So like say the Chromium maintainer <clears throat> Pulls in that every three day Chromium update and goes like, "Hey, this is going to take me seven and a half hours to compile because you know on sy some systems that's actually a thing." Yeah. Now he doesn't have to. Now he doesn't have to make a single change. Uh, and then run sudo make make or um make or build or wh whatever it, it is, and then wait seven and a half hours and then find out if you know like his change worked. <laughs> and I <laughs> instead he just. It is also important because it is a, it will be one trusted machine and one trusted set of machines that every maintainer will build their software on, which also means there is less chance for security problems that come from people people's machines being what people's machines are. And I'm not saying or... they, they will get compromised, but it's a lot harder to build infrastructure that should probably get uh, re, re, re instantialized every time that it will get problems than some random random guy's machine. Yeah, and uh, for like the, the extra nerdy low-level programmers out there, you might have uh, heard of this guy named Greg Crow Hartman. Uh, he is the Linux LTS maintainer, and he's like the number three guy for the Linux project, or like he number, number two, two or number three. He's number two. Something like he? some. He seems to be floating around lately. But anyways, he he wrote this blog post uh, a couple years ago, uh, going down like the security rabbit hole of <coughs> how much you can trust your software, right? Uh, so say that you are the most paranoid privacy advocate possible, right? And you want to grab a binary. And you don't trust that binary. So you compile it yourself. Well, yeah. do you trust your compiler? Not just trusting your compiler. It's trusting everything that is on your system. At that and point. your system itself. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> because it isn't this, necessarily the, the compiler that would be injecting things. It's... Yeah. Everything that is surrounded the compiler could be injecting before the compiler even gets its way. You have linters, you have yeah, uh, minifying code, you have that, that. Like there is so many things that happen. CPU interrupts. Yeah, there is, <laughs> so, and and just plainly a service that looks at uh, code, looks at every file in, in your uh, around your code, and tries to change it. That can also be a a compromise. Or, you know, it could just be a bad memory sector or something like that. Uh, that you know, just causes all kinds just, of weird issues. Just random non-security related issues. That could yeah, be but anyways, trouble at the end. Anyways, if you're truly paranoid, uh, I will see if I can find a link for that blog post. but And uh, see if I can find it for you and put it into the show notes. If I can't find it, I, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> but uh, anyways, the second piece of infrastructure that Valve is providing, because, you know, they are the build service. They're also going to act as a secure signing enclave. Because, you know, it, it makes sense that if you're building on the servers, you might as well sign the packages on the same server. I'm not sure if they will be the build, build, build service, and but they will provide the uh, uh, monetary backing to to support those and, of course, to set them up. Whether they well, will be uh, build, acting as those or not, that's another question. I guess. Well, I know that game developers say that like the biggest advantage that Steam has isn't the fact that people have it installed. It's that Steam works workshop uh, service that they offer, which uh, you might recognize from like your game mods. But that's actually like a whole build service that Valve yeah. operates for for yeah. uh, these people too. So they've already got infrastructure. They uh, know what they're doing infrastructure when it comes to build service and all that. So, but at the end, like, what is build service, especially for somebody, someone like Arch? Or some group like Arch, because they already have their own GitLab server. All they need is some place to host their runners, and yeah. they, that means just they need just lo load of money to buy those servers and deploy them somewhere, or pay some cloud provider to host them for them. Yeah, and they and they say that the uh, and uh, Mr. Poliak here is saying that this uh, this opportunity allows us to address some of the biggest outstanding challenges we we have been facing for a while because you know uh so it turns out that cpu cycles also cost money <laughs> and uh the collaboration will speed up the progress which means that your package updates now come in faster which uh i'm certain that there's arch linux enjoyers out there that love love running that that pacman command to update the system every hour of the day you're welcome uh, and uh, ultimately also unblock them from pursuing some of their planned endeavors, like, you know, uh, moving more packages away from uh, the community or extra repositories into the core repo. You know, maybe maybe an Arch, they might pull in, like, more of these community members into, like, the core, core Arch Linux team. And, you know, we might see from Arch Linux go from, like, a minimum viable core system to a core system that also has like these desktop environments packaged in the core repository, which I I think would would uh, help them a lot with like better integrations because you know you when you install like KDE Plasma on Arch Linux, you there is still some manual configuration that you might have to do to to get like the fully advertised Plasma experience. So that that just makes things like that potentially better. And uh, I look forward to that. Now, uh, if you don't know why Valve is, is working with Arch Linux specifically, it's because, you know, Valve seems to really like Arch Linux itself because uh, they've based, like, uh, SteamOS, the official operating system for their Steam Deck, yeah. off of Arch Linux. Yeah. It's a bit downstream, but uh, it does exist. And uh, so I would assume that there's probably a couple of developers at Valve that <laughs> do run Arch Linux. And uh, it's kind of famous in like the the uh, gaming crowd to use Arch Linux for gaming because, you know, it's apparently a good, good enough operating system for that, even though I, I have nothing but issues with it, seemingly. Yeah. And uh, Big Pod and more. Possibly good news, but maybe slightly fishy. Yeah. Yeah, Cloudflare is now secure by default for free users. Yeah. And uh, if you want to not be secure, you have to give them money. I'm still questioning where that that interpretation of it is correct. So, for all of for the, we're specifically talking about the section with uh checking your passwords. As soon as you log in, it checks passwords on have I been pawned, and we're not sure if we have this correctly or if they actually force free users to do the check and paid users can disable that check, but we're not sure if that's the correct inter interpretation of it. And yes, this is a really good thing that should happen whether or not you 
you think that's a good idea? It's a good、well, good idea. I think security that is not paywalled is always a good idea. Now it depends purely on how it's implemented,、uh, for like it to continue to be a good idea. But I like that the I like that it's pay to opt out. I like the idea of that, because you know,、uh, Cl- it, this is a free service that Cloudflare is using. Yeah, Cloudflare is a massive company, right? Yeah, and so I would, and、uh, they offer a lot of free services for people, which means that the you know they probably spend a lot of money on just the free tier. Yeah, and、uh, you know, there's you're they're going. This is going to cause. I guarantee you, this is going to cause that segment of the free users who want no security provided by Cloudflare to you know maybe actually give Cloudflare money. Yeah, because you know, I imagine that there's、care. somebody out there. There, there, I imagine that there's somebody out there that just has the domain name and doesn't want anything else to do with Cloudflare. <laughs> yeah. Or you know they just want to make use of the Cloudflare cash, or you know like their、uh, CDN <clears throat> service or something. Who knows? And now,、uh, how does this impact like the typical user? Not really. Not really. It it's it's more like for the people that actually run the web, the, the websites, and for、yes. for some dis for some disclosure,、uh, we do actually make use of Cloudflare ourselves. It, yeah. It's it's what.、Uh, Our podcast,、uh, if you download it via, via the RSS feed, is distributed through the Cloud, Cloudflare、uh, CDN CDN services, and、uh, I do buy the domain through Cloudflare. So, but that's really about it. We're not running. I'm not running like the proxy、uh, because every time I turn on the proxy, it just seems like it just doesn't work. But、uh, one, if if you know we continue to grow, we might figure out how to get that turned on one day. Yeah, and we might need to have a lot more. <laughs> From Cloudflare, yeah, yeah, we we might we we might need more, and you know, I might need to pay for a second web server to、uh, serve for some、yeah. load balancing purposes. But anyways,、uh, we have an update from the previous episode, <coughs> and、uh, you guys might remember that、uh, I kind of just briefly mentioned this、uh, top level domain provider, and and how they、uh, randomly changed their. DNS address to something else, and then somebody bought the old domain name. That's for well, who it, is servers so one of the one of the apparently very important servers in the in the structure of a top level domain. Yeah. Now for、uh, some some reminders here,、uh, we're talking about the dot m o b i dot mobi domain. Yeah. And、uh, this domain is typically used to like for like、uh, verification of does a mobile web page exist. The, that's typically what's used for. for a mobile web page. And、yes. yeah, and、uh, what happened is that、uh, this guy was going to a conference. I think it was Black Hat, if I remember right. And uh, he he uh, did some snooping on this, and he just suddenly saw that the old domain for this service was available. So he bought the domain, spun up his own Whois server, and immediately realized that、uh, he got like two to three. Three hundred thousand requests, which means that people are still using the old domain name. Yeah, and, and went to dig a little bit further and realized that the old who is provider never informed people that they changed their domain, <laughs> or what is well, more likely, software that hits who is server never got updated. Yeah, and uh, anyways, uh, this caused like. A a bit of a、uh, ruffle of the feathers in the security community, and、uh, you know、uh, this guy got into yeah this guy got a little bit well known. Well, it turns out that this guy runs with this company called Watchtower, and、uh, Watchtower took the time to write out the full blog post as to what happened,、uh, how they discovered this, and, <laughs> and what、uh, they what they found. Interesting. Yes. In after、and、after I, they did all that. Yeah, and I love the title of the blog post. We spent twenty dollars <clears throat> to achieve RCE and accidentally became the admins of Dot Mobi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a it is a great name, and I love it. <laughs> But yeah.、Uh, anyways, they spun up this. They had some fun with it at first. Uh, you know, it, after the disclosure and all that, and uh, you know, that they 
they worked with other services to and even the uh the dot mobo res- registry uh which is the the group that originally ran this old domain uh th- they worked with them and you know now the old domain name points a pro- appropriately to the new domain name yeah. so uh hopefully this doesn't happen again but you know the fact that th- that they did this for just a twenty dollar investment <laughs> they could sometime for a twenty dollar investment is insane yeah uh all they had to do is just buy a domain name and uh that is i we mentioned it last week if you if you're a top level domain provider don't let your old domain names expire yes ever ever yeah because there's gonna be somebody out there that doesn't run an update yeah (laughs) so uh that's gonna be it mostly for the show itself but big pod we got a comment really on spotify wow it i didn't get notified of this but i found it nice uh this commenter also turned out to be our very first patreon subscriber i'm not gonna name him uh not, because you know uh i i i didn't ask him if i could and i and you know so i'm just not going to but anyways he said that he loves the show but some of the topics that we talk about he does not understand at all yeah. and uh you know what i'm gonna take that feedback to heart and uh you know when we get the, delving into like these super complicated topics you know like the vpn topic uh we're I'm going to I'm going to do some more research on that and see if I can do a better job for you because you you decided to hit that join button and give us a couple of dollars. So, thank you. And if you're listening to this or watching us on the YouTube's and you want to support us, go to patreon.com/notuxallowed. Uh we don't have a huge amount of like you know like the Patreon special things, but you know, we will give you a higher quality audio feed. And um maybe we Maybe we might get post like exclusive content to that feed in the, in the future. Who knows? Uh, as the com- as you know, the community behind the show grows, the more the more incentivized we might be to like produce the extra content for you. Uh, we yeah. also have a Discord server that you can join as well. That's going to be linked in the description because I'm not going to say that the URL because you know I'm not paying Discord for the custom URL yet. But if you would like to uh, shout at us. Not through Spotify, but through, through like the uh, service that you know I actually have notifications enabled for. You can always send us an email to contact at tuckspace dot com, and uh, we have gotten angry emails in the past telling us that you know our website's down, and I thank you for doing that <laughs> because you know sometimes I don't even check my own website, <laughs> yeah. so it probably wouldn't have been found out until like the Sunday when we go to hit the upload button, or whenever we hit the upload button. But anyways, uh, you can always send us an email there. It doesn't have to be angry, but you know, uh, I love that, that uh, you know, the emails that we do get go- uh, typically start with, this is an angry email. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, if you can shout us directly, uh, these these uh, links that you see here are our Fediverse links. And uh, what you can type these addresses <coughs> into your Mastodon uh or federation enabled service so like your uh what is it instagram instagram, instagram threads yes instagram threads yes or if you have federation enabled in instagram threads you can type that address into the search bar and that should pull up our individual accounts that's where we primarily hang out but uh we've also got these things called youtube channels too yes uh, which of course is going to be linked in the description and you know uh i know i said that i that i recorded a video and it never got posted because, you know, it turns out that I had things wrong in that video. So uh, we're going to have to re-record and re-edit that one. <laughs> My bad. I, I took I took it for the final watch and I'm like, this is wrong. I'm wrong here. And I know that I've said, I probably said some things that are wrong on the show. So send us the email and let me know what I said wrong because, you know, I would <laughs> like to apologize for that too. But anyways, that's going to be it for the show. Uh, and of course, the the responsible disclosure: if you download our show from the RSS feed, you are downloading it through a server that we pay for. And you know, uh, our Patreon subscriber is now helping supplement that cost. And of course, as the show grows, the the, the more our hosting 
might actually wind up costing us too. Because it turns out that uh, having a basic VPS, pretty cheap. Having that VPS serve multiple terabytes of data, that's when it gets expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so, help us get, get a hedge bet for the day we explode. Please. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, that's going to be it for the show. I'll see you. Goodbye.